Hello and welcome to Enlightened Empaths, your community for the spiritually awakened, where we discuss, explore, and connect with fellow empaths, healers, intuitives, and seekers. Hello empaths, we hope you're having a wonderful week. Denise and I are going to be talking about the seven laws of spiritual love which is a really big topic, but I think it's important for empaths to really learn to focus on truly what love means in terms of loving yourself and learning to be peaceful and joyful with your own essence, your own soul inside your heart. And I think right now with so much fear, with so much anxiety, with so much overwhelm, you know, John Lennon nailed it. Love is the answer. And that seems to be coming up more and more and more with articles that you read or speakers that you listen to or any deep dive that you're doing into a spiritual practice. It always keeps coming back to love. Yeah. And I think it's interesting that it's whenever you read about stuff like this, it's seven the seven spiritual laws of love, the seven spiritual laws of success. You see that number 777 over and over and again. And that has always been a number of creation and being a seeker. And really, love is so much about creating, creating that space for love and seeking that love. I don't mean outside of yourself, but inside of yourself, and then seeing its reflection all around you. Well, on a just a really basic level, the other day I was listening to someone and they were very, very impassioned about a topic. And it was extreme. And I'm, I don't need to go into what the topic was, but I could sense their their passion for it. That's the best way to describe it. But after I finished the call, I thought, how many of us are feeling that passion, but are we throwing wood on the fire? Are we keeping everything at a high pitch? And I feel like this conversation today is, can we shift that a little bit to say, can I bring this with love, with peace, with hope, with guidance, rather than fury and anger and malice? Because that's not going to make the changes that we all so desperately want and need. Yeah, that is so, so true. I think it's important when you talk about impassioned topics like that to be curious and not judgmental, right? Not not one-sided. And right. when we focus on love, I do think it helps us come to that that place of peace in our heart. The reason that we decided to talk about this is we came across an article, and it did talk about these seven spiritual laws of love. And the first one that they talk about is coherence. And you know, this is saying basically that the first and most primary relationship you have with yourself is that divine union with to love yourself, to really accept who you are and what you're doing. And I think as empaths, many of us struggle with that either because of our conditioning or the way we're wired or the the sensitivity. But coherence to me is an odd word to describe that, but it's about truly finding a way to embody that love in your own heart. And I'll, I'll sometimes I'll say to people, can you imagine if if someone loved you the way that you always love. And I think that that kind of exemplifies that is how can we pull that into our own hearts so that we have that much more to give, but also to treat ourselves with that level of kindness and love that we give to other people. Yeah. And why is that so hard? I don't know. You know, I don't know, but it's a damn uphill battle, isn't it? I remember when my, <laughs> when my kids were learning about unconditional love in one of their religious classes at school and they came home and they were talking about it. And Tori said, so you love me unconditionally, mom. And I was like, yes, nothing would ever change that. And she said, well, what if I did something terrible, like committed murder? And I was like, nope, I'd still love you. And Chloe goes, what if she killed one of us? And they were trying so hard to come up with, they were throwing all this stuff out there. What if I did that? What if I did this? What if I didn't do that? What if I said that all these awful, terrible things? And I kept saying, no, I'd still love you. And and just watching them go, really? It was so interesting. I mean, they were they were younger, but it was so fascinating. And I, I do remember thinking, you know, if I did something terrible, would I still love myself? And yet, I don't know, because we're so hard on ourselves. 
We are. When the boys were younger, I can't remember which one of them said it, but said, so if we were both drowning, who would you save? Oh, not a Sophie's (laughs) choice. (laughs) And I said, I guess I'd have to jump in and we'd all have to go down because I couldn't pick one of you over the other. But it's just, it's funny how their little minds work, isn't it? It really is. Well, because it's a big concept for them to grasp, never mind us as adults. Right. And going back to the coherence part, um, Donna Eden, who is an amazing, you know, energy of love quest, she, she has amazing healing programs. Her take on this is the energy of love is the energy that connects us all. And everyone can use this energy because it's on our innate ability. And even though we're joking about the questions that our kids asked and this and that and and topics that came up, this really is a given right to all of us on the planet is to feel love, to have love in our hearts and to treat ourselves with, with that type of love. And one of the things that they suggest is, and we, we've talked about this in countless shows, is the awareness of, of, you know, you put your hand on your heart, you breathe love into your heart. And you can feel a physical and, and energetic connection with that. So even just work around your heart chakra or uh, deep breathing or filling your heart with love. Those are all great ways to start to maybe tiptoe into a deeper self-love and sense of coherence. Yes, I think the loving kindness meditation is a great way to do that as well. Yes, We need to post that on our Facebook page because that is such a beautiful, I hate to say poem, but it's like a poetic prayer that really does help you learn to not only love yourself, but then to to send that love out and see it in others too. Right. Now, the second spiritual law of love is benevolence, which is about seeing the, the purity of love, the goodness and the wholeness that comes with loving yourself and others without condition or judgment. It's also about healing any false narratives you've been taught or are still telling yourself about love. I think that's a really important law is to really take some time to examine what have you been taught or shown about love? You know, what model of love did your parents give for you? What experiences have you had with love? What is your idea of love today? Has it changed, grown, and evolved How did you love yourself when you were younger and how are you loving yourself now? I think those are all really important things to ponder as we're, as we're discussing and trying to really reach in and learn to, to feel the energy of love in our heart, like you were saying before. Right. And I think, you know, we, we can use the example of our kids or our partner or our family or our dear friends, and we know what love feels like. We, we understand that. And I think some of the concepts we're talking about today are expanding that out in, into an even bigger uh, ripple effect. Um, and, and benevolence is one of those. But I think a really important thing to for many of us is if we have had our heart stomped on or we've had that pain of being vulnerable or hurt or or any of those horrific things that happen under the guise of love, that this might be a step towards healing, towards realizing that it's okay to open your heart again, because that's scary. That's really, really scary. And are we, as a collective, working towards the world becoming a more benevolent place, or are we going to keep it in that fear of uh oh, I might get hurt again. Yeah, a lot to think about. It really is. But you know what? You know what I think is scarier than than heartache and heartbreak and pain is not opening your up yourself up again. Right. You know? I think that's that's scarier, and I I think people just need to contemplate that if they are at that place in in their life. Choose your fear. <laughs> that's a good way to put it. Yes. And it's a, I think it's like grief though. It's an individual timeline and one person. So, you know, as mediums, we've talked to so many people that were married for decades and they still hold so much love in their heart. They don't want someone else to, it's not that they're, they don't feel the need to, to revisit that type of love. 
So I think that it's important to, we're talking about two different concepts there, I guess, but it, it's, it's an individual timeline with when you're ready to lower that drawbridge, I think. Yes. And I think you have to be patient with yourself until you are ready to let love in again. I think that's that's a really, really good point that you make. And in the meantime, focusing on just love itself and pulling that energy into your embodiment is so much more important than even opening your heart to a new love relationship, because you're not going to attract a healthy love relationship until you really focus on loving yourself. I don't mean you have to like master it, right? But you, I think it's important to, to at least become awake and aware of, of the love that is inside of you and the goodness that exists in your soul. And realizing that you deserve that from, from everyone in your life. And so many times, again, love is seen as a relationship kind of issue, but it's so much more. It's the, to me, it, it's that feeling of when you're in a really good place in your life and all of a sudden time stops and you're like, wow, life is pretty damn incredible. That seems to me to be a part of love too. Yeah. And I think I think you can definitely have those moments when you're in love with a person, but I've had those moments being in love with nature. Yes. hundred you know? percent. Yeah. I, I've had those moments staring into my dog's eyes. <laughs> <laughs> I'm serious. Sometimes I'll be petting Lily and I'm like, oh, I love you, sweetie. And you just feel that go through your whole body. So it doesn't have to be with people either. It can be with our four-legged friends and nature all around us. And I don't know, sometimes do you ever do something that's that's like maybe a nice thing you did or a beautiful gesture you decided to offer or just a really funny thought? And have you ever thought like, we're okay? Do you ever yes. have those, like, you know, I think doing more of that is so, so important. And that's part of being a, ben a benevolent person of love. Yes. Yes. Uh, the next attribute or law or whatever we want to call it is intelligence. And, you know, intelligence is a funny thing because people automatically think smart. And it's not that. It's more about how accepting and realize how complex that connection with divine intelligence. So I guess this would be the equivalent of me always yammering on about tapping into the collective. I think that the collective is an intelligence that we all have access to, and it can also emanate or reflect that love as well. Yeah. And I think this law is also about listening to the intelligence of your heart. Yes. You know, we're 100%. so adept at looking at the intelligence of our mind and our thoughts. But when we drop down into our heart center, like you were saying earlier, you can do that simply by putting your hands over your heart chakra and just breathing energy into that area and bringing your concentration to your heart. And we, and we can listen to what our heart is trying to tell us. I really do think that so often we go through life just listening to our head, to our thoughts, to our mind. But how often do we pause and listen to what our heart is trying to tell us? And one of the suggestions is to express, you know, that love and appreciation to your physical body. And there are countless memes and social media posts on self-acceptance and self-love. And, you know, are you not wearing your bathing suit to the beach because your thighs are too big? Or are you not enjoying things with your children because you're self-conscious or, have you been caught up in that comparative study? And I think this is also saying that love your body, but also love your mind, love who you are and, and what you have to offer because it's a limited time offer being here for all of us. And love that all of you. kind of dark, but no, yes. No. <laughs> but I think it's important to love all of you, to, to love your faults and, and your attributes, to love your gifts and your failures. And, and we're not making light of this because we both know personally, professionally, you know, just as social beings, how difficult this concept is. This isn't just like, oh yeah, now I love myself. It's all good. It, it's a process. And I feel like it's, it ebbs and flows with different stages of our lives, with different events in our lives, with different people in our lives. Oh yeah. I remember 
years ago, I was meditating and just kind of asking, like, what do I, what do I need to focus on now? And the message I kept getting was, you have to learn to love yourself as much as you love others. And I was like, oh, I, I don't know, Denise, at that stage in my life, I was so mad at that because I thought when you're raised without a good example of love, like when you don't have that mother love as your first primary model, learning to love yourself, I think for those of us who've had those experiences is extra hard. And I felt like like someone was handing me a, a Bible written in Chinese and told me, hey, translate this into English. And I'm sitting there going, but I don't know how to read Chinese. And they're like, yeah, figure it out. That's how I felt about all those messages I was getting in the beginning of my spiritual awakening about learning to love yourself. Because it is it is a complex issue, especially when it hasn't been modeled for you, I, I think, growing up. Don't you? Yes, totally agree with that. Because I think that that is where many of us are right now, is trying to rewrite that tape or we're trying to find that self-love. You know, that we we read countless articles and hear many therapists will suggest this, many uh, spiritual leaders will say, parent yourself or love yourself the way that you might not have received in the past. And that's another step to healing. And I think that's exactly what you're saying. Yeah. And I think that's what this intelligence law of love is about listening to what your heart is trying to tell you because your heart knows and sometimes it knows more than your mind knows quite often it does but we need to take time to really listen to it now the yeah. next spiritual law of love is called ever presence and this is talking about how love eradicates illusions and how it can never be divided or destroyed this law is about seeing love not only inside of you and in others around you but in everything in, in the leaf blowing in the wind and in, in the hawk soaring above you. It's about seeing the the ever presence of love and recognizing that it's it's never destroyed, it's never gone, it's never ending. And that's always, always comes through with uh mediumship readings. Love never dies. It continues. It's a, eternal. Our souls are eternal. We we have access to this presence, but I think when there has been, um, when you may not feel like there's any love or where there's been trauma or grief or loss or patterns that have repeated in relationships, it can be difficult to, to re-tap into that energy of feeling that love is always available and present in our lives. Well, talking about how love never dies in mediumship readings, if anyone is going through that kind of grief with a partner, I just want to say in all the readings I've done, I've never, ever, ever, ever had a partner come through to say, they better wait until they die and come over here before they find love again. Have you right. ever heard? No. No. No, they want, they want us to be happy. They want us to continue living. They want us to continue. And, and it's interesting when those, type of situations come up in readings, many times the person will say, oh, he never would have said that when he was here, or she never would have wanted me to be with someone else. And I think that it's reflective of people change when they transition and they see a bigger picture that they might not be able to embrace here. Yes. Yes. And I don't know why, but this reminds me of one of my favorite lines from the Golden Girls. <laughs> Whenever Sophia would talk about her husband in heaven, Sal, she'd go, may he rest in peace until I get there. <laughs> <laughs> so one, one thing to consider is if you are having a hard time tapping into this feeling of ever presence in love is maybe take a peek at some patterns you might have had in how love has shown up in your life or how you've chosen to love in situations, or maybe, and I, I think that's a harsh wake-up call when you wake up one day and you're like, oh my gosh, I've been here before. This is either the same person with a different face or this same scenario is replaying. But maybe just be gentle with yourself and say, am I repeating something? Do I need to possibly look at this from a different perspective so that I can open my heart and bring in something new and and truly tap into that that well of abundant love beautifully said 
And our next law of love is called splendor. And this law is about learning to allow the pure beauty and joy of love to enter your whole essence. So we're not talking about romantic love or passionate love or familial love. We're talking about the essence and the energy of love and just allowing it to flow through all of your body with each inhale and exhale and learning to live in that state of, of love, including self-love, but love for others. That's, that's, I think, a beautiful goal. And I think we can attain it for moments in meditation or when we're praying, but to try and hold that, that sense of splendor for longer than a couple of moments here and there when we're tuning within is so important. Right. And with this splendor comes healing. And I think we've both seen, known personally and professionally, people who have had severe trauma, loss, grief, fill in the blank, and they have become hardened or bitter or resentful. And that brick wall around their heart and around their ability to accept any love or hope in their lives I feel like this splendor aspect is saying, try to find a way. So when you use the example of looking into little Miss Lily's eyes and feeling that level of love, it might not be able to be with a person to start out. It might not be about relationships or, and I'm running a, a litany through my head right now of, of several people I've spoken with recently of, who have been either estranged from their children or fam, family disruption or just really heavy stuff, it's hard to hope that love could come back and help heal that. It is hard, but I think it's important because love will always, always be waiting for you when you're ready. It really, really will be. We recently had someone uh, in my church who decided to cross over because of a very, very painful divorce. And that, that idea of not you know, finding someone again or being alone was too much for that person to bear. And that has just weighed on my heart all week because it's just not true. You know, it's true if you choose it, I suppose. But but if you look at these laws of love, it's not true. We're right. never alone and we're never, you know, we always have choices and we always we always have opportunities and you just never know what's around the corner. Just knowing that even if if it's really dark right now, and, and we've both been in places where it's really dark, that it, the light will come back. The love will come back in some form. Just hang on, truly, because it's, um, it doesn't have to be a permanence in our lives to be stuck in that level of grief and pain. Yeah. Well, that's why I told you my favorite expression is, this too shall pass, because- right. I hold on to that in those difficult times of life, but I also hold on to it when I have those wonderful moments where most everything is going great to remind me this might pass too. Like just enjoy every moment. And I think that I think that is so important to do, especially when we're when we're talking about love. Enjoy the moments of love that are given to you. And you will find them even even in the darkest of times. It could be a stranger saying the right thing at the right moment. It could be someone showing up with a meal just saying, hey, you look like you're having a rough week. I'm here for you. It, you just have to be open to it. And when you follow these seven spiritual laws of love, it allows your heart to be open to those small and big gifts that love is always trying to deliver to us. Right. And that, that's big because this, you know, what just flashed in my mind is the grief that you feel when you lose a pet. Like that is a pure love because it, it is unconditional love with pets because that's what they give you back. Animals don't have an agenda. Most of them. Some are a little manipulative, but most not. <laughs> <laughs> but, but if you're able to it, realize that there, this is a, a, a possibility. I, I think that that's what this is is really about is it's, I, I think I have to throw this in though. Some people want to be alone and that's okay too. They want a quiet life. They don't, they, maybe in this lifetime, they've chosen something a little more hermetic or private, or they, they're not, they don't feel that they're losing something by not having maybe a, a plethora of people in their lives. But that doesn't mean that they're not experiencing love in a different way. 
So that's that's so true and important. And I think we have to respect everyone's choices. You know, I have a friend like that who has chosen a life of solitude and it mystifies me, but you know, and I'm always asking her questions like, do you get lonely or do you ever (laughs) think about, you know, (laughs) but no, that's her, that's her happiness. That's her joy. And I think it's important to honor that and, and respect that as well. And the difference is this person you're talking about is making a choice to live that lifestyle and is content with that. It's not because of the things we mentioned earlier of I've been hurt too badly. I'm not willing to give it another try. Yes, exactly. No, it's just, this is who I am. I've come to accept it. I don't need a lot of people in my life. It's from a place of being healed and whole. It just, you know, fascinates me. Mm Mm-hmm. Yeah, we're 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 interesting creatures, aren't we? Yes, we all are. <laughs> <laughs> now my friend has an uncle who basically lives like a priest and he does so many 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 acts of service. I couldn't even begin to describe them here. He is, you know, constantly bringing meals to the homeless. He takes care of disabled elderly people. He's just he's constantly his life is of service. He's like yeah. a little walking saint. And he said that he does get lonely, but he feels this calling that's bigger than that. And he said, you know, if I had a family, I wouldn't be able to do all these beautiful things. Wow. I know. I know. Very inspiring person. Oh, my goodness. So our next one is resonance. And this this one tripped me up a little bit because... No, resonance is a funny word. I think all of these are kind of funny words in in relation to spiritual laws of love, but then they make sense when we talk about them. Uh, Love being the ultimate resonance. You know, it, it truly is bringing all those disjointed parts of your being back together and merging them into the whole. It's beyond, um, it's a higher frequency. It's a higher vibration and think when when you're in love, like, okay, we'll use infatuation as an example. Everything is brighter and happier and things roll off your back and you're just like, oh my goodness, this is, I'm in love and it's good. <laughs> and that feels to me like that's the resonance of love, that, but it mellows into a deeper connection, a deeper level, a, a a, a beautiful, it's almost uh, like in music, you can hear the different vibrations and frequencies, but then it will meld into a beautiful timber that just, you feel it in your in your cells. That's what this this word feels like to me. You know, I was listening to a psychologist being interviewed on a podcast years ago about the power of love. And he told this story about this man who was been seeing him for, I don't know, two or three years. And he was really, really depressed. And, and you know, the psychologist said he kind of had a right to be like, everything was going really crappy in his life, really, really bad, uh, traumatic, dramatic divorce. Uh, kids were pulled between both sides. His career was stagnating, money issues out the wazoo. Like it was just a lot of bad stuff going on in his life. And he, I think he came to see him like every two weeks or once a month. And you know, he hoped he was helping him, but you you don't know when you're going through those difficult times. And the guy comes in to the next session, beaming, glowing, looked 10 years younger, smile ear to ear. And he's like, what happened to you? You, you look amazing. You're so happy. It's shining out of your being. And he said, I met someone and I think we're, I think we're falling in love. And the psychologist said nothing else in his life had changed. Nothing. The divorce was still crappy. They were still hammering out custody. The job was still sucky. But in this man's life, because he had found love, none of that mattered. He was happy. And that story always stayed with me because it reminded me of the importance of feeling that connection to love, you know, how it does transform everything else in your life. Right. And it ties back to what we said earlier of that self acceptance, that self love. If you're finding love in any area of your life, it does allow you to feel it more for yourself and your situation. So what this word also triggered, though, is the Schumann resonance and how we're all connected to that vibration of the earth. And we did a show on that um, last year, I think. But maybe one of the ways is when you, this whole call right now to the earth energy, to healing the earth, to healing each other, 
But maybe a way to reconnect with that feeling of resonance is to ground yourself, to walk barefoot outside, to remember that the earth is holding and protecting us all. It's, it's here for us. We're a part of it. And that sounds a little esoteric, but not really, because I do think that that's another form of love. So oh, I totally this word resonance. Yeah, no, I, I totally agree. Allowing allowing Mother Earth to hug you. And yeah, it does sound a little woo woo and hippie ish. But you know what? Who cares? Because it works. I told you about that, that big magnolia tree out in the woods behind the clubhouse in my neighborhood. And sometimes when I'm walking little Lily, we'll just sit under that tree and like the branches come around. So it is like the tree is hugging you. Oh, I don't mean to laugh, but my kids make such fun of me when, when I make them sit under that tree with me, but I'm like, get it, get a hug by the tree. And they're like, oh my God, mom. But you really can't put yourself in those positions where you allow yourself to feel the support of the world around you. This law of love also reminded me of the very first sentence from the Course in Miracles about how there are only two things in this world, love and fear. Love vibrates at the highest level and fear vibrates at the lowest level. And when you put yourself in that resonance of love, it's going to lift and raise your vibrations out of that lower vibration of fear. And so it's so, so, so important to think about things you can do each day that lift and raise your vibrations towards that highest one of love. Oh, very well said. Okay. And the last one is imminence. This law is about seeing love even in the painful moments that have challenged you, that have helped you grow and allowed you to move on to a deeper level of your journey. So there's a lot of forgiveness in this. There's a lot of really looking at situations involving love in your past that have caused you pain and seeing it not necessarily like I forgive you or I forgive what you did to me or that whole traditional view, but more seeing it through the eyes of love like, wow. You know, if this hadn't have happened, if I hadn't have met you, if we hadn't have hurt each other or broken hearts or whatever it is, I wouldn't be this person I am here today, which is badass and strong and a, a better person. It's it's re-changing, reforming the way you look at painful situations in your past through the lens of love. Oh, that's that's an excellent way to describe it. Yes. And the forgiveness part of... And if you're having old loop tapes or old memories or why did I or could this have or this imminence can be a step towards that, again, or self-acceptance and forgiveness to realize that you're, you're worthy, that everyone is worthy of this love and to see it as a gift. And I'm sure there are people who are rolling their eyes or, and saying, well, that's real easy to say, but... It goes back to what you said a minute ago of this too shall pass and breathing in that forgiveness. I, I really, from watching many people over many years from working my, um, I have a really strong background in uh, behavioral disorders and, um, you know, emotional disruptions, emotional disturbances, uh, all of those things. That was my professional life for many years. And I, can't say enough how much anger, resentment can fester in someone and, and cause a pinball effect towards other issues, other behaviors, other choices. Maybe if we could find a way to infuse some love into that with this, this sense of imminence, it would uh, make a difference. And I'm not discounting psychological difficulties or mental health issues. That's not what I'm saying. But if you're personally feeling a, a deep level of anger and resentment, please, for your own health and wellness, try to find something that will help lessen that within yourself. I think it's important to really take a bigger viewpoint when you're going through those difficult moments as well. You know, when I was in the first stages of my divorce, there was so much anger and hurt, and there was so much bickering back and forth and texting this and my lawyers sending you that. And I, I hated it. It wasn't me. It wasn't who I wanted us to be. I, I just hated it. And I sat down and I thought, what do I, what do I want this to look like in five years and 10 years? I don't want it to look like this. It's not good for me. It's not good for my kids. And so I just called him and I said, 
you know what? I, I don't, I don't care. Like we just need to put this behind us and move forward because I don't want to walk our daughters down the aisle alone. And I don't want to welcome our future grandchildren into the world without you by my side. And we really haven't had a major fight since then. So I think it's really important to just look at the bigger picture. What do you want this to look like in five or 10 years? Whatever the hurt is, it doesn't have to be a, a personal relationship. It could be a familial one or a friendship one as well. But what do you, what do you want this to look like in five or 10 years? And if you, if you do want it to just be gone and eradicated and, you know, well, that's a different thing, but many, many times you do want that, that pain of that relationship to just not end and go away like that, but to transform into something different. You know, agape, the Greek word for love has so many definitions. And just because you may no longer be in love with a person, it doesn't mean you can't still love them or, or want them to be a part of your life in a, in a different way. And I think if we can kind of rise above the, the angst of the moment and think, what do I want this to look like when this, when this anger has dissipated and this sadness has, has settled and gone away and been healed? Because it will, it will. It might take time, but it will. And I think when we focus on that, it helps us transform the moment. That's, that's a very good point. That's a very good point. And if you're in the camp of realizing that that's not a relationship that you want to continue with, it's really, really a wonderful feeling when you wake up and you you, you don't have that anger or you don't have that resentment. And you know, from a personal experience in my own life, when I woke up and I couldn't be angry because I was the one that changed. I changed the rules. I changed the direction of things. How can you blame someone else if you're the one who decided to do it a different way? Because you weren't happy with the way you were being treated or the way things were playing out or whatever that might be. And I think that's really important. But you know what I absolutely love about love <laughs> <laughs> is, is it's like the weather. It, it, it treats everyone fairly. It doesn't matter who you choose to love how you choose to love them, where you are on the planet, we all have equal access to this, which I think is pretty damn incredible. Yeah, I do too. And the the well or the fountain of love that exists existing inside of our souls, just from the spark of creation that was put in us when we were created, it's there. And I think it's up to us to connect with it and grow it and love it and nurture it. In whatever that way that works for you. Yes, exactly. Okay, before we end, since we're talking about different types of love, I just w did want to share quickly. I, my sister sent me this article. It's called, um, it's based on Mandy Len Catron's modern love essay called To Fall in Love with Anyone, Do This. And I think the New York Times reposted it and it went viral. And it's 36 questions that you ask someone. And according to research, if you ask your partner these questions, you'll fall in love or fall in love again. And so I'll, I'll post this on our Facebook page, but there are all sorts of different questions. Like if you could change anything about the way you were raised, what would it be? Uh, if a crystal ball could tell you the truth about yourself, your life, the future, or anything else, what would you want to know? Is there something you've dreamed of doing for a long time? Why haven't you done it? So they're just like really, really deep questions. Oh my. I that know. would be interesting to read. And and also what what flashed in my mind is how uncomfortable that would be for someone that was shy and introverted. Well, oh. you know what I, I I agree. Like I'm just I'm just picturing like, you know, the average person, you know, you come up, you show up on a date. So <laughs> <laughs> I have 36 questions. Can you imagine? But I was thinking this would be great for a journal prompt with yourself to fall in love with yourself. Oh, oh, yes. You know, um, it says like question 28, tell your partner what you like about them. Be very honest, saying things that you might not say to someone you've just met. Well, that would be a great one to journal about for yourself. You know, tell yourself what you like about you. We both have said this. I don't think there's any shortcut to this is you have to find a way to at least become more comfortable with who you are and then work towards the love for yourself. But it's really hard to love someone else or love anything in your life if you can't find any semblance of respect and dignity and love for who you are as a human being. We all come with our unique blueprint. So there must be something in there you can find to love about yourself. 
Oh, a hundred percent. Oh, question twenty four. How do you feel about <laughs> how do you feel about your relationship with your mother? Ooh. Oh yeah. That could be a loaded question that for some could people. Be. Question 21. What role does love play in your life? See, now that would be a good one for journaling. Okay. And of course, if, if anyone listening to this is not cueing Tina Turner in their head, then I'm concerned. <laughs> oh, that's really, really funny. Well, I just think it's important to to contemplate those those deeper questions about ourselves first before we can present them to a, a partner in our life. And so it really does all start within. Yes. It is about getting to know ourselves and getting being open to how other people are on the planet too. It's going to bring us together. I really believe that in my heart. I do too. And that's what it's all about. Union, balance, harmony, and love. Yes. Well, thank you guys so much for listening. We hope this has given you lots to think about and chew on and look up those 36 questions. Let us know if you if you do make your partner sit down and answer all of them. I'd love to hear how that goes. That would be interesting. <laughs> Maybe if you're going on like a summer road trip. <laughs> oh, you might get left in a rest area. That's true. <laughs> Have a great week, everyone. And please remember, as always, to show up, do great work, and share your light. Take care.